1876, Americans celebrated the nation's 100th birthday. When it was over, all that was left were silent mementos. One year later, that would change. For the first time, the sounds of historic events, the words of famous people, and music could be recorded. Thomas Alva Edison, the man who invented the phonograph, had no theoretical training in acoustics and only a few months of formal schooling. He despised grand opera and he was almost totally deaf. Thomas Edison patented more than 1,000 inventions, including the first incandescent light bulb and one of the first motion picture cameras and projectors. But the phonograph would always remain his most original and favorite invention. He called it his little fella, his baby. Myland, Ohio, 1847. Here, on February the 11th, Thomas Alva Edison was born. A bright little boy, born late in life to his kind and understanding mother. From his father, Edison inherited a restless mind and a zest for life. At six, Edison was full of questions. How can a baby goose come out of an egg? Explanations only set the boy thinking and experimenting. This experiment was fairly harmless, but later he accidentally burned down the family barn. In Port Huron, Michigan, where the family moved, some experiments were more like pranks. At 11, young Edison was often in the family cellar, experimenting with chemicals instead of studying at school. Edison started school, but the teacher said he was inattentive, possibly stupid. His mother pulled him out after only three months. He never went to school again. When he was 12, Tom became a newsboy on the Grand Trunk Railroad which connected Port Huron with Detroit. He set up a press and wrote and printed his own newspaper. While printing his paper, he accidentally caused a fire for which the conductor beat him. Some said this caused his hearing problem, but it was more likely to be the result of scarlet fever. there would be no more experimenting on the Grand Trunk Line. But Edison would soon be back selling papers. One day, during a stop at the St. Clement Station, Tom rescued the station master's little boy from a runaway car. As a reward, the boy's father offered to teach Tom telegraphy, unaware that he'd been studying the subject and even built a few telegraphic instruments on his own. Tom began hands-on training. The nation was in the midst of civil war when 16-year-old Thomas Edison got his first job as a Western Union telegrapher. For four years, he wandered from station to station, reading about telegraphy and dreaming up ways to improve it. So, in 1868, while other restless young men were heading west to seek their fortunes, Edison decided to go in the opposite direction, to Boston. 
When Edison came to Boston, he was coming to one of the key innovation centers in America at that time. Uh, not only was it an a important area in terms of telegraphy, uh, second only to New York, but more importantly, it was the center of a machine shop culture. And uh, this is what he found there. He found uh, skilled machinists who were uh, able to take inventions uh, turn them into working artifacts that then he could continue to uh, play with until he got them right. While supporting himself as a telegrapher at night, Edison spent his days at Charles Williams' machine shop, working on ideas for inventions. Within a few months, Edison filed his first patent for an electric vote recorder, the forerunner of modern voting machines. It was refused by Congress overwhelmingly. This defeated what they were in Washington to do. They wanted to filibuster. With an electronic vote counter, there was no reason for this. Edison was horribly disappointed and vowed that as a result of this fiasco, he would only invent products for which there was a market. If he couldn't sell it, he was not going to invent it. Penniless but optimistic, Edison informed fellow telegraphers that he was now a full-time inventor. He went to New York, where he met electrical engineer Frank Pope. Pope liked the budding inventor and provided him with a home, introductions to investors, and work manufacturing and inventing telegraphic devices. The first invention that really paid off was a stock printer that revolutionized Wall Street. To collect his pay, Edison went to Western Union's lavish New York headquarters to pick up a check for $30,000. Within a month, the money was gone, most of it to equip a new factory and laboratory in Newark, New Jersey. At 24, Edison was running the whole operation. On Christmas Day, 1871, Edison married Mary Stilwell. She was 16 years old when he married her. She was a clerk in his factory, and she came from a very uh, humble origins in Newark, New Jersey. And I think that she was starstruck. After a brief honeymoon, Mary returned to their home, while her husband eagerly returned to his lab and his first true love, inventing. Not yet 30, Edison had a steady income and a measure of fame, but was restless. In 1876, he decided to move 12 miles south to a quiet country place called Menlo Park. Edison needed a place where he could both be separated from but connected to the rest of the world. And a place like Menlo Park filled the bill perfectly. He was setting himself up, not as a manufacturer, but as a professional change maker, making a living as an inventor. In Menlo Park, Edison bought a large house for his family, which now included daughter and son, Marion and Tom, Jr., whom the former telegrapher nicknamed Dot and Dash. For the single men, there was a boarding house. Just a few steps away, the office and library. And just beyond that was the laboratory, the heart of Edison's small communal village. With generous financing, mostly from Western Union, and with the best supplies and tools at hand, Edison and his team set to work on several projects in the summer of 1876. One was a repeating telegraph, a device to record an incoming message on a disc, then repeat it to the next station down the line. At the same time, Edison was working on a new transmitter for the telephone, recently invented by Alexander Graham Bell. Envious that Bell had invented the telephone first, Edison wanted to solve Bell's main problem. The voices could barely be heard. On the night of July the 18th, 1877, while Edison and his boys were in the lab testing a diaphragm from the telephone transmitter, Edison made a momentous discovery. He was playing in the laboratory one night, and as they were playing with the diaphragm, he put his finger under it and realized that there was enough movement there that he might be able to uh, cause an impression in a piece of wax paper or something else 
that would allow him to, in a sense, uh, repeat the message to play it uh, once it was recorded, to play it back so it could continue over the line. That night, Edison scribbled in his notebook, there is no doubt that I shall be able to store up and reproduce automatically at any future time the human voice. Full of confidence, Edison thought he would invent a kind of telephone answering and repeating machine, but he was actually about to invent something far more original, the world's first phonograph. The path from idea to invention is rarely smooth. When Edison started thinking about a phonograph, he knew he wasn't the first to record sound. A Frenchman named Léon Scott de Matanvay had already done that, 20 years before on a machine he called the phonotograph. But Edison didn't know that another Frenchman, Charles Crow, had recently written a paper describing how to play back sound as well as to record it. But what Crow conceived, Thomas Edison achieved with a little help from Charles Batchelor, a British-born draftsman, mechanic and problem solver, and John Cruzy, a Swiss-born master machinist. Even with help, work on the phonograph began very slowly. In fact, the word phonograph doesn't appear in Edison's notes until one month after he reached the conclusion that he could record and play back sound. Two weeks later, Edison reached another important turning point. On September 7th, he sits down and draws up what's essentially a, a list of possible things he can do with the phonograph. They're all things we would be familiar with today, uh, but uh, this is, marks the beginning of the phonograph as a completely separate uh, technology. Two months later, Scientific American announced that Mr. Edison had a wonderful new invention for a talking machine. It was a deliberate press leak, written at Menlo Park. In reality, there was no phonograph, not even a sketch of its final form. On December the 3rd, Edison considered three different formats, tape, disc, and cylinder, before making a final decision. Fifty years later, he would recall, I designed my original tinfoil phonograph in cylinder form and gave it to my faithful John Cruzy to make. He made fun of it. Whether Cruzy made fun of Edison's drawing or not, he made it work. On December the 6th, he sent word to the boss that his new invention was ready for a test. In 1927, on the golden anniversary of the phonograph, Edison remembers what he said. The uh, first words I spoke in the original phonograph, a uh, little piece of practical poetry. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. <laughs> to everyone's surprise, Edison's words came back just as he'd spoken them on the very first try. Edison later said he was never so taken back in his life. But for now, he couldn't wait to spread the news. The very next day, Edison took the phonograph to the New York office of Scientific American for the first public premiere. The event was a sensation. I mean, if you read the articles in Scientific American, for example, that announced the discovery of the phonograph, you're struck over and over and over again by the amazement. All of a sudden, you can record your voice and play it back at any time, now, 50 years from now, a century from now. Well, they were astounded by being able to do that, but they were also astounded by something else, that the apparatus was so basically simple. Edison's tinfoil phonograph was mechanically very simple and its operation easy to understand. To make a recording, a person speaks into a horn, which directs sound waves towards a thin metal diaphragm. When the sound waves strike the diaphragm, they cause it to vibrate. And as the diaphragm vibrates, it also vibrates an attached needle. 
As the cylinder rotates, the needle makes indentations in a thin piece of tin foil. To play back the recording, the process is simply reversed. In this case, using a separate diaphragm and needle. By following the indentations, the needle and diaphragm vibrate, sending the same sound waves back again. Although the phonograph is very simple, at first, many people thought it must be magic. Edison was kind of an alchemist, really, in the public's mind. They felt that if, in, if he'd lived in the 1670s as opposed to the 1870s, you know, the, the benighted dark ages as opposed to the enlightened late 19th century, then he would have been burned at the stake for his views, that he was communing with the majesty of Satan. It wasn't long before Edison had a new title, the Wizard of Menlo Park. He was an international celebrity, and everyone wanted to see and hear his magical machine. In April, the wizard took a new demonstration model to Washington to show members of Congress and the Patents Committee. President Hayes was so thrilled with Edison's invention, he woke up his wife so she too could record and listen to her voice. Before leaving Washington, Edison had his picture taken at the studios of Civil War photographer Matthew Brady. A second photograph was taken. The man on the left is Uriah Painter, one of a group of investors who bought the rights to exhibit Edison's machine. By the summer of 1878, however, public interest in the phonograph had faded. By October, Edison suddenly abandoned all work on the one invention that he always called his baby. I think it's very interesting because it was more his baby than his own kids who were his babies at the time. He spent more time with his baby machine than he did with his baby kids, all of them, three of them at the time. And um, he nurtured that to a certain point, like he would with a real baby. And then just like he did with his own kids, he totally turned his back on it because he got bored. He wanted to do something different and exercise his imagination more uh, creatively. Edison's new passion was electricity and the incandescent light bulb. How to bring light to people's homes, streets and industries became his consuming passion for almost 10 years. In 1881, after three years as a virtual orphan, Alexander Graham Bell took in Edison's baby. Well, Alexander Graham Bell, when he heard about the phonograph, was astounded that he hadn't thought of it. So after Edison had given it up, uh, Gardner Hubbard, who was one of the leading principals of the Edison Speaking Phonograph Company and also Bell's father-in-law, uh, pushed him into working on this, this device and trying to make it a practical instrument so that, in fact, they could exploit it. With prize money awarded by the French government, Bell set up a new lab in Washington. He assigned the task for improving Edison's phonograph to his cousin Chichester Bell, a chemist, and Charles Tainter, a scientist and instrument maker. Working in secret, Tainter and Bell produced the gramophone. One key improvement was that the recording surface, instead of tin foil, which could only be played two or three times, became wax-covered cardboard. A motor, typically driven by a foot treadle, replaced the hand crank. Recognizing that the gramophone was really a set of improvements on Edison's invention, Bell suggested that they pull their patents and join forces. Edison was furious. Under no circumstances will I do business with Alexander Graham Bell or his pirates. Instead, he resolved to rescue his baby and make a new and better phonograph, a finely engineered machine that bore the name of the original inventor. Thomas Alva Edison. In 1886, when Thomas Edison decided to reclaim the phonograph, he was too involved with other matters to give it personal attention. Edison was about to leave Menlo Park. He'd spent little time here over the past eight years while working on electricity. 
he started work on a much larger laboratory, office and factory complex in West Orange, New Jersey. Edison also had a new wife, 20-year-old Mina Miller. His first wife, Mary, died suddenly from a brain tumor at 29. Unlike Mary, Mina came from a distinguished and wealthy family. So when the couple moved into Glenmont, their elegant new estate in West Orange, Mina took it all in her stride. On their honeymoon, Edison scribbled a few ideas about improving the phonograph. But, still deeply involved with electrical concerns, he handed responsibility for the phonograph to others especially Ezra Gilliland, an old friend, fellow inventor, and employee. Now they were known as Damon and Pythias. That's how close they really were. And they grew up together, and they were friends in young adulthood, and Gilliland helped introduce Edison to his second wife, which is a very crucial thing. Edison and Gilliland were so close they built winter homes in Fort Myers, Florida, side by side. Edison drew up the plans. But to Gilliland's dismay, after working on the phonograph off and on for more than a year, Edison suddenly decided to take control. Edison threw himself into perfecting his baby. One reason for this change was that the Bell Tainter gramophone, recently introduced as a dictating machine, was getting the kind of press that Edison loved. The time to catch up was now or never. With massive effort over eight long months on June the 16th, 1888, after a final 72 hours of work, the perfected phonograph was finished. At 5.30 that morning, he had his picture taken. It's the most famous photo of Thomas Edison. And what a different image from the young inventor of ten years earlier. The pose was undoubtedly calculated to present a new image. Mr. Edison, as the Napoleon of invention. He had a color version hung in his office. The recording surface for the phonograph was now wax instead of tin foil, an idea stolen from Bell and Tainter. But Edison had a far better compound. The wax could be shaved and reused hundreds of times. With the work of invention finished, Edison sold rights to exploit the phonograph for $500,000. He asked his trusted friend, Ezra Gilliland, to handle negotiations. Gilliland negotiated a secret deal with the buyer, allowing him to collect $250,000, half of what Edison got. When Edison found out, he felt utterly betrayed. The friendship was over. He never spoke to him again, ever, for the rest of his life. And let's remember that um, they had built those houses together. Edison did not go back to Florida for 15 years after Gilliland betrayed him. That shows me the depth of his animosity, his revulsion at this turn of events. Edison geared up to produce 200 phonographs a day. He thought his invention would be mainly used as a dictating machine in offices. But his first big order was for something less practical. Tiny phonographs for talking dolls. With an imported beast head and lifelike hair, the doll was pretty, but there were a few problems. The mechanism was really too fragile to be used inside a child's toy. The records were very soft, made of a brown wax material. Any kind of bumping or jarring would break the record, and the records were not replaceable by the doll owner. In addition, the sharp stylus that was used on the record would only allow one, two, three plays, perhaps maximum, 
before the stylus actually cut through the record and made the record unusable. Another problem was the quality of the recordings. Edison would later say that he found the voices of the little monsters exceedingly unpleasant to hear. With little progress solving these problems, Edison gave up. By 1890, the phonograph had found a home in concert halls, where people gathered to hear their favourite tunes. Sing-alongs were popular. But the most popular and profitable use of the phonograph was in phonograph parlours, in penny arcades, in hotel lobbies and train stations. By dropping a nickel into the slot and using the listening tubes, people heard a rousing salsa march, a Stephen Foster song, or a bit of 19th century humour. Oh, you lucky devil, where did you get that girl? Tell me on the level, have you ever kissed her? If she has a sister, lead me, lead me, lead me to her Mr. G. The popularity of slot phonographs kept Edison's factory humming. Coin machines also boosted the fortunes of the Columbia Gramophone Company, at the time Edison's only rival. Both companies were constantly asked to make more records. The phonographs created thousands of new jobs and gave birth to a new industry, music recording. Young Johnny Jones, he had a cute little folk and all the girlies he would take for a blow. At first, every cylinder was an original. Performers must sing the same song or play the same tune over and over again. Sometimes it was possible to record on several machines. The recordings are mostly marches, minstrel songs, instrumental solos, and sugar-sweet songs like Edison's favourite, I'll Take You Home Again, Kathleen. What you really have here is somebody with very, very traditional pedestrian, or shall we say, middle-of-the-road tastes, that he believed this was what the rest of the American public had an obligation to uh, attend to, which was coming from Thomas Edison in his role as setting the tone, as it were, for what people should listen to in their homes. And if it was good enough for him, it was good enough for everybody else. In 1893, most phonographs were still in recital halls and penny arcades. Very few were in private homes. In the mid-1890s, the latest novelty was motion pictures, and Thomas Edison was too busy developing motion picture equipment and making movies to pay much attention to the phonograph. Columbia introduced the first gramophone designed for the home market. It had a new spring motor that resulted in a relatively lightweight and affordable machine at $75. Shocked into action, it took Edison two years to come up with his first home phonograph, a superior machine priced at only $40. Two years after that, there was the Edison Standard Phonograph at half the price. Then, the very next year, Edison brought out the gem, at only $10, the least expensive phonograph. But by the time Edison got into the home market, there was a completely new competitor, the Berliner Gramophone, the world's first disc record player. The creator, a young German immigrant, Emil Berliner. In 1877, Berliner invented a telephone transmitter, which he sold to Alexander Graham Bell. And ten years later, he filed his first patents on the disc record player. Like most patent models, 
The first machine was rather crude, but it already had one big advantage. It was relatively easy to mass produce flat disc records, and Berliner came up with a novel way to do it. There was a button manufacturing facility called the Duranoid Plastics Company, and they stamped out buttons of various sizes. Uh, uh, and my grandfather said, why not press disc records on the button machine? And so he did eventually. Two years after the invention, he began pressing records and they were five inch discs. And interestingly, the compact disc that's so popular today is also a five inch disc. By the late 1890s, Berliner had a better way of duplicating records, and his gramophone had a fine new spring motor. But in 1901, after surviving an exhausting patent suit, Berliner decided to sell all his assets to Eldridge Johnson, the man who made his new motor. Along with Berliner's patents, Johnson got US and Canadian rights to a painting titled His Master's Voice, which Berliner had bought in England one year before. The machine in the original painting was a phonograph. The artist had offered it to Edison's British company, but they saw no value in it. The artist painted a Berliner machine on top of Edison's, and Eldridge Johnson owned a trademark that became one of the most famous trademarks in the world. As the 20th century began, Edison was riding his own wave of success. Sales were up to more than one million dollars a year, and the first golden age of the phonograph was underway. Edison had found a way to mass-produce records. They were called gold cylinders, because the process involved electroplating gold onto a wax master. In the coming years, Edison's company continued to develop better and longer playing cylinders. From the very inception of Edison's business career, he believed if he was going to produce a product, it had to be the best. From the very beginning, he was very proud of the name Edison. He put the name Edison on all of his products. And he felt if his name was on the product, the quality must be there. While Edison was concerned with technical quality, his competitors were more interested in changing public tastes. Early in the 20th century, Victor began adding operatic arias to his repertoire and signed an exclusive contract with the rising Italian tenor Enrico Caruso. In 1906, the Victor Company made another radical change. In the early 1900s, all of the phonographs had an external horn. It was a very large, very cumbersome, unwieldy affair and housewives objected, number one, to the looks of these horns, number two, of the fact that they protruded into the room and people constantly bumped into them, and number three, they were horrible dust collectors. The Victor Talking Machine Company heard this complaint, and they addressed it. They took the horn from outside the phonograph cabinet and placed it within the cabinet. So now it became part of a piece of furniture. We now had the first home entertainment system, the phonograph, the internal horn, and storage area for records. Priced at $200, the Victrola was an instant success. Edison had to respond. His answer was the Amberola, a very handsome machine, also $200, but it played cylinders. By 1910, when the first Amberolas went on sale, cylinders were on their way out. Eventually, there's a greater and greater demand for discs. Although he believes that the recording technology of cylinders is superior, discs have a lot of advantages. They're easier to use, they're easier to store, and so Edison, in fact, has to go and invent his own uh, disc record. To do so, Edison spent more and more time at the lab, where his team had already begun work developing a disc machine and record. When Edison threw himself into a project, he worked around the clock. During the week of September the 10th, he put in 111 hours and 48 minutes, a heavy load given his 65 years.
As ever, Edison's main interest was the quality of the sound. But, deaf in one ear, and barely able to hear out of the other, judging sound quality posed quite a problem. Edison's solution was to sink his teeth into wood, so that the sound could vibrate through his skull to his inner ear. The marks on the framework of this disc phonograph test model were made by Edison's teeth. Finally, Edison and his team produced the finest disc record diamond needle reproducer and playback machine of its day. In 1917, sales had reached an all-time high, and the future looked rosy for Edison and his competitors. But they didn't realize that the first golden age of the phonograph was about to end. As the First World War came to a close, Americans celebrated the chance to return to normalcy in the words of their next president, Warren Harding. But with new fads, fashions and prohibition, life in the Roaring Twenties was hardly normal. Harding's successor, Calvin Coolidge, declared that the business of America was business, and Henry Ford agreed, rolling out a Model T every 10 seconds. The energy of the 20s was set to a new rhythm, jazz. Beginning on segregated race records, African-American artists like Louis Armstrong created a new American art form. Jazz records began to cross the color line, and the phonograph began to bridge black and white America. Americans were on a spending spree, and there was a tempting new product. Radio technology had been around for decades, but in 1920, radio became a consumer product and broadcast stations popped up all over the country. Thomas Edison hated radio. For Edison, the technology was the key, the best quality sound. That, had always, that why, is why he resisted discs for so long, and it's also why he resisted radio. The sound quality was so bad that he thought, in fact, it would be harmful to the phonograph, especially since a lot of the early programming was playing recordings. And so here was something that was, in fact, diminishing the quality uh, that he had spent so many years uh, developing. Despite tempting adverts, phonograph sales plummeted. While Edison declared radio was a fad, his son Charles disagreed. Charles had been working for his father for several years. Now, acting head of the company, he argued that they should start making radios, like Victor and other competitors. His father responded with a resounding, no. Every single action that Charles Edison took in the purported role as head of this company, his father had to sign off on it. He ended up writing a memoir called Out of the Shadow, which really explains this relationship having to do with domination versus emancipation, a classic father-son struggle. The struggle continued and became more heated after 1925 when electronic recordings were introduced. While Charles worried about the future, Edison was out and about soaking up praise as the great inventor and the most famous man in America. He also enjoyed well-publicized camping trips with his friends Henry Ford and tire magnate Harvey Firestone. He didn't seem to have a care in the world. Whenever Charles was able to talk to his father, he continued to ask about radio. In 1928, Edison finally gave in and said, I'm telling you it's no good, but if you want to be a damn fool, go ahead. By 1928, radio sales had jumped to more than $500 million a year, and phonograph sales were still falling. When Charles brought out the first Edison radio in January 1929, he had little hope that it would save the Edison Phonograph Company. Nine months later, while Edison was in Michigan with President Hoover celebrating the 50th anniversary of the electric light bulb, Charles was in West Orange preparing redundancy notices. On October the 29th, 
he sent word to Edison distributors announcing that the Edison Phonograph Company was no longer in business. The same day, the stock market crashed. News of the crash dominated the headlines, and not until nine days later did people learn that Thomas Edison would not be making phonographs or radios again. By 1929, Edison had lived a full life. He knew it. He was by no means finished. There were things that he wanted to do. But he realized that he could not be the commander any longer. Happy? I'm sure he wasn't. But he was also realistic enough to understand that this was the end of the road. There was nothing he could do to reverse the course that the Edison companies were taking. And it was a matter of turning his back and walking away from it. The twenties had been hard on Edison and his competitors. In the early thirties, some people thought that all phonographs would end up on the scrap heap, but their predictions were soon proved wrong. In 1934, prohibition came to an end. And the jukebox made a grand appearance. Swing was in, and it seemed like everyone felt like dancing. By 1940, there were 350,000 jukeboxes. Record sales rose as fast and furious as jitterbug dancers. In the late 40s, there was a major revolution launched by Thomas Edison's oldest competitor. Come 1948, the Columbia Company introduced one of the greatest innovations in sound recording. There they are. They came right back in and said, we're not defeated. <laughs> We've got an invention of our own. And of course, it was the long playing record, which was not made of shellac. It was made of plastic or uh, vinyl or vinylite. And it was a marvelous, marvelous innovation. With the new long playing records, the old problem of running time seemed to have been conquered. Listeners were able to enjoy more than 20 minutes of music on each side. But the LP, which runs at 33 and a third revolutions per minute, soon had competition. The 45 RPM single introduced by RCA. Each of the problems Edison had struggled with were being solved, culminating in the late 1950s with stereophonic sound. In 1982, after more than 100 years of continual improvements, a truly new recording technology appeared, the digital compact disc. In 1878, one year after inventing the phonograph, Thomas Edison wrote down a list of ten ways phonographs could be used in making people's lives richer, including talking books for the blind. It was a dream, but the man was so far-sighted that in his own time, he couldn't accomplish what he really wanted to do. But in later years, long after Edison's death, his dreams were fulfilled. The phonograph was Edison's favorite invention, and in many respects that may be because it was the prototypical mythological invention. It was the one that sprang from nowhere. And that's what made his reputation. The phonograph is what made Thomas Edison Thomas Edison. And after the phonograph, now the greatest inventor of the age, as he was called as a result of that, could in fact do anything he wanted. Looking back at the years and inventions that followed, particularly the light bulb and motion pictures, it seemed that there was no limit to what the great inventor could do. The legacy of Thomas Edison is as amazing as the sounds from the first tin foil phonograph. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. 
<laughs> Next week at the same time, Modern Marvels discovers the awesome dimensions of the only man-made object visible from space and finds out who built it and why. The Great Wall of China. <laughs>